Where did the Japanese people really come from? Long before samurai, cherry blossoms, and sushi, the islands of Japan were home to ancient peoples whose origins remain shrouded in mystery. 35,000 years ago, Japan was a frozen landscape, connected to the mainland by land bridges. The first humans likely walked across from Sakhalin into Hokkaido, braving the Ice Age in search of a new home. But were they really the ancestors of modern Japanese? From the echoes of Jomon hunter-gatherers to the rise of the Yamato, join us as we uncover the true story of Japan's inhabitants, where history, genetics, and legend collide. Before we dive in, like, subscribe, and hit the bell so you never miss an episode of Journey Through History. The origins of the Japanese people are a mystery with unexpected twists. Were they bold seafarers from distant lands, or a unique fusion of cultures forged over millennia? The Jomon, known for their distinctive cord-marked pottery 13,000 years ago, remain an enigma. How do they connect to modern Japanese? Did Japan's ancestors come from the north, the south, or a mix of both? Scholars have spent decades untangling this web, and the debate is far from settled. Modern Japanese ancestry is shaped by two major migration waves. The Jomon, Japan's first settlers, skilled hunter-gatherers. The Yayoi, rice farmers from Northeast Asia who transformed Japanese society with agriculture and metal tools. But who were the first Jomon? Two theories compete for the answer. The Northern Route, the first migrants from Sakhalin or Siberia, 35,000 BCE, were genetically linked to modern Japanese. The Southern Route, people from Taiwan and Southeast Asia sailed to Okinawa around 10,000 BCE, leaving traces in Japanese genetics and tooth shapes. Were early migrations sparked by rising sea levels around 14,000 years ago. One of the biggest clues to Japan's origins lies in its DNA. The Jomon people carried a rare genetic marker, haplogroup D, found today only in Japan, Tibet, and the Andaman Islands. This suggests the Jomon had deep, ancient connections to other early populations in Asia. However, the Jomon remained isolated for thousands of years, developing their own distinct culture before the arrival of the Yayoi. Genetics isn't the only clue to Japan's past. Our bodies still carry traces of migration. Even something as simple as teeth shape and earwax type reveals connections to ancient populations. Shovel-shaped teeth, common in Northeast Asians, appear in most Japanese today, but traces of Southeast Asian-style teeth survive in Okinawa and Hokkaido, hinting at older migrations. This is because Asian populations have two types of teeth, shovel teeth, synodonty, common in China, Korea, and most of Japan. Non-shovel teeth, sundodonty, found in Taiwan, the Philippines, and Hokkaido. This suggests a Southeast Asian migration into Japan before another wave of shovel teethers took over. Around 300 BCE, Japan's history took a dramatic turn. The Yayoi people arrived, bringing agriculture, metalworking, and irrigation, transforming Japan from a land of hunter-gatherers into a thriving farming society. They spread fast, outcompeting the Jomon and shaping modern Japan. Rice cultivation wasn't just a new food source. It became the foundation of Japanese civilization. But why did it take so long for Korean farmers to cross the sea? Some say they waited until they perfected rice farming, developed iron tools, or faced population pressures. Others point to climate change. Warmer temperatures in Japan made it the perfect escape from harsher conditions. One legend links the Yayoi to Qin Shi Huang's sorcerer, Shu Fu, who supposedly sailed off in search of immortality and never returned. Some say he landed in Japan 
mistook Mount Fuji for his mythical mountain and introduced Chinese farming, metalworking, and medicine. While the timeline doesn't quite fit, it's a fun historical mystery. But the Yayoi weren't just an advanced Jomon evolution. By the late Jomon period, food was scarce, and survival took priority over innovation. When the Yayoi arrived with wet rice farming and iron tools, they had a clear advantage. Why did they come? Likely to escape the chaos of China's Warring States period, seeking stability, not just land. These weren't just refugees, they were innovators, bringing agriculture, metallurgy, and weaving looms. But did they replace the Jomon, or mix with them? That's the real question. The Yayoi weren't a single group, they were a mix of migrants from across Asia. Some Japanese later claimed descent from the ancient Chinese kingdom of Wu, while DNA and archaeology point to a northern route through Siberia, Mongolia, and Korea. Some argue they mixed with the Jomon, while others claim they replaced them, making early Japan a prehistoric game of musical chairs. But there's another theory. Similarities between Yayoi culture and Southeast Asian civilizations suggest possible influences from Java and beyond. How far did these connections reach? The debate continues, but one thing is clear. Japan would never be the same. Believe it or not, earwax reveals migration patterns. Jomon DNA is linked to wet earwax, while Yayoi descendants mostly have dry earwax. A student-led DNA study mapped this pattern across Japan, supporting the theory that the Yayoi spread from Kyushu. While the Jomon and Yayoi shaped modern Japan, people moved in and out constantly. But genetic studies confirm that today's Japanese population is mostly a mix of these two groups. The Yayoi spread across Japan, mixing with and eventually outnumbering the Jomon people. This led to what scientists call the dual structure model, the idea that modern Japanese people are a mix of both Jomon and Yayoi ancestry. So most Jomon people were absorbed into the Yayoi population, but some survived in Hokkaido, evolving into the Ainu, Japan's indigenous people. They looked different, with wavy hair, thick beards, and unique eye shapes. Their culture? Absolutely fascinating. Elaborate face tattoos for marriage and the afterlife. Pet bears. Yes, real ones, raised like royalty. Bear sacrifices because bears were gods in disguise. With unique facial features, wavy hair, and distinct traditions, the Ainu are the closest modern descendants of the Jomon. However, despite early speculation, their similarities to some European groups are purely the result of independent evolution in cold climates, not genetic connection. We'll cover the Ainu in greater detail in a future video. And the migrations didn't stop there. While the Yayoi shaped early Japan, recent discoveries suggest another major wave of migration during the Kofun period. Genetic studies reveal that a third wave of people arrived from mainland Asia, contributing up to 70% of modern Japanese DNA. These new arrivals likely came from China's Yellow River Basin and mixed with the Yayoi-descended population. This explains the rapid cultural development the rise of imperial rule, and Japan's increasing ties to the mainland. By the first few centuries CE, waves of settlers fleeing war in northern China arrived, bringing advanced metallurgy and political systems. Some even rose to nobility, their legacy still echoing today in place names and family lineages that trace back to this transformative era. China and Korea had official clans in ancient Japan, not some mythical Shu Fu escape story, but real documented families recorded in texts like the Nihon Shoki and Shinsen Shojiroku, completed in 720 and 815 CE. These records list 1,182 families in three categories Imperial Ancestry, 335, Divine Ancestry, 404, 
and Foreign Ancestry 326, known as Torai Jin, or people who sailed across. Among them were powerful Chinese and Korean clans, including members of Goguryeo, Payakchi, and Silla. The most famous were the Hata and Aya clans, whose origins are still debated. The Hata, pronounced Qin in Chinese, were even rumored to descend from Qin Shi Huang, while the Aya, Han in Chinese, claimed links to the Han dynasty. Some scholars doubt these royal lineages, as early Japanese history is filled with semi-mythical narratives, like emperors supposedly ruling for over 100 years. By the Kofun period, Japan's population had become a complex blend of Jomon, Yayoi, and a third wave of migrants from China and Korea. The Kofun period didn't just finalize Japan's genetic makeup, it marked the rise of the Yamato state, the origins of imperial rule. Now let's also bust a common myth about Japan's early history. The old invasion model claimed that every cultural shift, from pottery to burial mounds, came from waves of foreign conquerors. But new research says otherwise. Sure, Japan had connections with the Asian mainland, but many changes were homegrown. Instead of a revolving door of invaders, ancient Japan was a place of strong internal continuity, where local innovation thrived alongside borrowed influences, more remixing than outright copying. The Yayoi didn't just toss out Jomon traditions, they mixed in new continental influences, like iron tools and bronze mirrors, creating a cultural fusion rather than a forced reset. The Yayoi and Kofun periods weren't about blindly adopting foreign trends. They were about adding a Japanese twist, like tweaking a family recipe. So forget the invasion saga. Early Japan was more DIY nation than conqueror's playground. The Yayoi were casual collectors of cool new things, while the Kofun period saw organized leadership managing foreign relations the Kofun period started with borrowing, but ended with mastery. Japan wasn't just importing culture, it was refining it. By the later Kofun period, Japan had refined its identity before saying, thanks for the inspo, but we've got this. This era set the stage for how Japan would handle foreign influences for centuries, balancing openness with knowing when to pull back. For too long, Archaeologists treated the Jomon, Yayoi, and Kofun as separate worlds. But the truth, there's a clear cultural thread linking them. The Yayoi didn't just appear out of nowhere, and Japan wasn't just a passive recipient of foreign trends. Instead, it took outside influences, bronze tech, farming, governance, and gave them a distinct Japanese spin. The arrival of the Yayoi didn't just change Japan genetically, it also shaped its language. Japanese is often mistaken as being related to Chinese, but the two languages share little in common outside of borrowed writing systems. The Japanese didn't have their own script, so they adapted Chinese characters to fit their language, a system called kanbun. Over time, they developed manyogana, using Chinese characters purely for their sounds rather than their meanings. This eventually evolved into the kana syllabaries used today. Hiragana for native words and grammar, and katakana for foreign influences. These writing changes marked Japan's transition from simply borrowing from China to developing its own distinct identity. Some theories suggest connections between Japanese and Korean, while others propose links to the Austronesian languages spoken in Taiwan and the Ryukyu Islands. The truth, Proto-Japanese likely developed as a fusion of influences, absorbing elements from multiple ancient cultures. The earliest form of the Japanese language, known as Proto-Japonic, likely split into two branches, one developing into the languages of the Ryukyu Islands and the other into early Japanese. But here's the interesting part. This linguistic divide mirrors the genetic divide between the Jomon and Yayoi. Did the Yayoi bring a new language with them? 
Some believe the Jomon spoke a language closer to Ainu, while the Yayoi introduced what would evolve into modern Japanese. Over time, the Yayoi language took over, just as their agricultural society did. Proto-Japanese, which later evolved into the Yamato dialect, spread across the islands, mixing with older linguistic traditions, the Yamato dialect, which later morphed into Kyoto's refined speech, spread across Japan like the hottest trend. But in Kyushu and Tohoku, traces of old Yayoi dialects still linger. By the middle and late tomb periods, linguistic influences shifted. Instead of just the Kaya dialect, you'd hear echoes of Puyo, Goguryeo, and Payekche. This wasn't a full language reboot, more like a fresh coat of paint. That's why Japanese and Korean still share a secret linguistic handshake, so synced they finish each other's sentences. This shift wasn't just linguistic, it reflected a changing society, from the Yayoi farmers to the powerful rulers of the Kofun period. One thing's for sure, Japan's ancient past is far more complex than a simple one-way migration story. Japan was a cultural crossroads long before the samurai era. Whether its ancestors were island-hopping Austronesians, motivated Korean farmers, or proto-Mongoloid Siberians, Japan's past is a fascinating mix of migrations, adaptations, and a whole lot of unanswered questions. As more discoveries unfold, we move closer to solving these historical puzzles. So, what do you think? Do these genetic findings rewrite Japan's history? Japan's story is still unfolding. Every new discovery reshapes what we think we know. So, what's next? Could modern migration create a new shift in Japan's genetic history? Let's discuss in the comments. The origins of the Japanese people are a fascinating story of migration, adaptation, and cultural fusion. From the ancient Jomon hunter-gatherers to the rice-farming Yayoi and the later Kofun era state builders, Japan's history is shaped by waves of people who didn't just replace one another, they blended, innovated, and laid the foundation for the unique culture we see today. Genetics, archaeology, and historical records continue to reveal new layers of this complex past, proving that Japan has always been a dynamic crossroads of civilizations. If you enjoyed this deep dive into history, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell notification so you never miss out on a journey through history. We'll see you in the next one.